question. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Irma Moreno and I am one of the pre-health advisors um, at the Career Center and um, myself and Kelly Lee are co-chairing the um, first gen event series that we have along with our colleagues Heidi Yu and Mike Harris. Mike um, is an advisor with engineering students. Heidi is an advisor with the LNS um, students and a liaison with EOP. And Kelly um, is also with LNS, um, works with LNS students and pre-law students. And I work with pre-health students. <clears throat> We're really happy to have with us um, an alumni today, um, Oscar Garcia. Um, and Oscar Garcia is the founder and chief empowerment officer of Aspira, a Silicon Valley training and consulting firm. He is an introvert turned international speaker. Can't wait to hear about that. He's given over 300 seminars and tra trained over 12,000 professionals. <clears throat> His career journey includes business development roles at five startups, co-founding a nonprofit, chamber president and CEO, and community partnership manager at LinkedIn. His clients range from startup incubators to educational institutions and brands like Oracle, Aruba, Networks, Palo Alto Networks, McKesson, Genentech, Wells Fargo, the US Embassy, UC Berkeley, and Stanford. Boo. <laughs> He's also the host of the Dynamic Podcast Career Talk with OG. Um, as Chief Empowerment Officer, Oscar empowers you, so opportunities come to you. Welcome, Oscar. I'll let you go ahead and take it. But before I do that, let me remind everybody that you're free to ask questions in the chat. And Heidi, Mike, Kelly, and myself will go ahead and monitor that. We will have a Q&A portion at the end. And at that point, if you wanted to um, turn your mic on and, um, and then unmute yourself and ask the questions, Oscar's open to that as well. So go ahead, Oscar. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Irma and uh, Kelly and Heidi. My, my pleasure to meet you. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, uh, you can let me give me uh, sharing abilities, please. You're good to go. All right. Uh, there we go. Okay. You see? You see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So again, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I have been looking forward to uh, talking to you, sharing with you, giving you some tips today on how to tell our first gen story so we can get hired okay and uh you know the whole uh, career services uh team is wonderful actually a, a year ago this i think it was a year ago this month or maybe it was in january last month uh, last month i was in person doing another talk on how to network and uh boy how much things have changed in, in a year so go ahead uh throughout the the talk feel free to um Again, submit your questions via the chat. I will definitely leave time at the end. I'm also going to give you my contact information so that you can reach out to me. And uh, of course, you know, one of the, the uh, uh, I think one of the great platforms, social media platforms that you can connect with, uh, with me is via LinkedIn. So you're welcome to do that. Um, okay, here is the agenda. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, number one, I'm going to tell you, share with you some of the top six soft skills that companies look for. The reason why I'm focusing on soft skills is because that's part of our story, right? Like a first in story, okay? And so I'm going to connect that. Um, but before I connect and show you how to tell our story, I am going to uh, walk you through some foundational steps that we need to take in order to be able to uh, uh, tell that story. Then of course, number three, I'm, I will get into your, <clears throat> excuse me, your actually uh, career story, how to craft that, how to share it, and how to tell it. Um, also, I've been asked uh, by the career services team to talk about how to uh, connect, how to network, how to build connections with people. And then lastly, how to sustain those relationships. And I refer to it as how to nourish uh, relationships. So this is the agenda uh, for this afternoon. Okay, 
before I get started, I want to tell you a quick little story. So that fountain, okay, in 1992, yes, I graduated in 1992, and I don't, I'm not afraid to tell you how old I, I, I am. Next month, I'm going to be 52 years old. And you know what? I have more energy than probably most of you that are on this webinar here, okay? So I am damn proud that I'm about to be 52. But in 1992, the economy wasn't as bad as it is at all today, but we were in a recession. And my good friend, Will Rivera, best friend in college, we had just walked out of Poly Ballroom, had gone to a career fair, and totally disillusioned, disappointed, sitting there on that fountain. And I started, I told Will, because I'm a, I'm a Chicano studies major. Chicano studies major, okay? I'm not an engineer like some of you I see here, you know, bioengineer and, you know, data scientist and so forth, which I applaud you, believe me, I do. But I walked out of Poly Ballroom and, and there were very few employers that were looking to hire. Most of them were looking for engineers. They weren't looking for a Chicano studies major. Those companies that were looking for a Chicano studies major wanted me to sell life insurance. I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't go to Cal to go sell life insurance. So I was totally disillusioned there. Right? Like, what am I going to do? Where am I going to work? Well, folks, you can watch another presentation where I get into some more specifics on my career journey. But I will tell you this, folks, that today, this Chicano studies major who was completely disillusioned and all these engineers, these smarty pants that were getting hired by these big companies, today, I have trained and I continue to train those VPs of engineering, chief technology officers, I help them transition careers. Isn't it amazing how life works? This Chicano Studies major is now teaching these engineers how to transition into their next uh, career. But see folks, you might be wondering like, okay, what do you do Oscar? Like big deal for you. Well, let me tell you something, okay? We all go through obstacles. English is my second language. Yeah, I know. Maybe some of you are like, wait a minute, how can that be Oscar? Listen. I learned how to speak English when I was in kindergarten, okay? All right, so obviously it was easy. But the minute I learned how to speak English, I became my parents' translator until they passed away about five years ago. Some of you can relate to that. Also, low income. I was on the free and reduced lunch program in elementary school, right? One line for the free and reduced lunch program where you know they give you all the fatty food. And then there's my other friends, my white friends who's parents usually was the mom would bring them you know or you know with the lunch you know uh or send them you know with their their nice peanut butter and jelly sandwich and so forth and here i am on the free and reduced lunch program also okay in high school i got a's in english i sucked at the sat score okay which i think is why they put me in bonehead remedial english class at berkeley and i'm like wait a minute did someone just lie to me? Because I went through four years of high school, A's in English, and then all of a sudden you're telling me that my English sucks, my English writing. And those of you that, that know about subject day, right? They only give you two chances. You don't pass it, they boot you out. Also, my parents, first grade education, my dad, my mom, middle school education. I told you that I'm speaking English. In third grade, they couldn't even help me with my multiplication and divisions because they didn't speak English. And lastly, as Irma pointed out, yes, my personality, my natural personality is an introvert. Any talk that I do, those of you that are introverts, you know it is draining to come up and, and speak. And you know what? It is even more draining to do webinars when most of the people have their cameras turned off. I literally nowadays, because I've done so many of them, I can literally go up to the wall and just give a presentation as if I'm speaking to a thousand people because I have to get used to it, okay? So I share this with you folks because yes, I have experienced some success, overcome some challenges, but like many of you on this webinar and many of you that are gonna watch the replay of this, I've also overcome many obstacles. So let's talk about some of the soft skills the companies look for. We oftentimes, and at Berkeley is guilty of this, okay? Because Berkeley is more geared toward tech for engineers. We oftentimes focus on the technical skills, but I'm gonna tell you this, LinkedIn back in 2017, 
did a, 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 a research, uh, came out with a report and looked at what are the top six soft skills that companies look for. Adaptability, culture fit, collaboration, leadership, growth potential, and prioritization. These are the soft, ten, uh, top six soft skills, soft skills that companies look for. So I'm gonna walk you through, teach you how we can look at our story and connect it to these soft skills. But like I mentioned to you, I wanna walk you through first three key things that you and I need to do first, the foundational step in order to be able to craft our story. Number one, it is critical that we honor the past. What do you mean by that, Oscar? Honor the past, your past. We all have a story like I mentioned. My dad in Mexico was a butcher. He had his own meat business. And then here, when I was in fifth grade, 11 years old, one day my dad says, hey son, get the buckets, knives, and towels ready. And I'm like, what the heck are we gonna do, dad? That was a start for about six or seven years. We would go every Friday to the slaughterhouses. I live in, in, in Mountain View. We would go to, Mor to Half Moon Bay, Morgan Hill and Gilroy slaughterhouses and we would kill a pig, cow, goat and we would sell fresh meat the way they do it in most countries. Some of you are all like, you know, think you're all that in a bag of chips because you like bought fresh meat at Whole Foods. Can I tell you something? That's frozen food meat, okay? That is not fresh meat. So anyways, all of a sudden I disappear from my friends on the weekends. Hey Oscar, how come you don't hang out with us anymore? How come you don't play anymore? Oh, because I'm busy. Doing what? I'm just busy. No, you know what it was, folks? I was embarrassed to tell my friends that I was cleaning menudo, cleaning the intestines of the pig to make chorizo. I was, I was just embarrassed. In fact, even when I went out to college to Cal, I would come home every Friday. We didn't sell meat anymore, but we continued to make chorizo. And I would come home to Mountain View help my dad make chorizo the next morning, Saturday morning at 7 a.m. while some of you, not right now because of the pandemic, but pre-pandemic, those of you that partied Friday night and Thursday night at your fraternity parties that still hung over on Saturday morning, sleeping in, my rear end at 7 a.m. was at the San Jose flea market selling chorizo. Why do I tell you this story, okay? Because one, like I said, I was embarrassed about it. But you know what though, folks? When I look back at that, those are some of the best life lessons that I learned. I learned a work ethic. I learned how to work hard. I learned how to prioritize my schedule. I learned teamwork. I learned delayed gratification. Those are skills that to this day as a business owner and throughout my career has helped me tremendously. See folks, here's the thing. The second thing we need to do is we need to reframe our narrative. We all go through crap in life. Crap stinks, but it's also fertilizer. Isn't manure fertilizer? How we react to the challenges in life, it is our choice. And that's what I've done. I've learned how to reframe my story and turn the crap, the challenges of my life into fertilizer to help me fertilize my dreams and keep going. Number three, it is also important that we learn how to be vulnerable. See, in some cultures, like in the Latino culture, we have this machismo thing. Boys don't cry. You know, that's only for girls or this and that. And that's not true, folks. I have feelings too. You all have feelings too. Vulnerability is a strength. And I want to share something, a quick little video here, but let me just, because I forgot to um, show the, with the sound here. Let me come back.
So folks, I shared this video on social media, particularly LinkedIn. Yep, I told people my story, very vulnerable and scary, okay? What, Oscar, isn't LinkedIn like a professional platform? Yeah, it is. Then why would you share it there? Why not on Facebook? Because one of the things that I've learned over time, folks, is that it's not business to consumer, it's not business to business, it's human to human interaction. And at the end of the day, at the end of the Zoom, at the end, there's a human being that has feelings. And I've learned to stop trying to connect with people's mind to try to impress them with my Cal degree and instead connect with their heart. Connect with people's heart first. And the way you do that is by sharing your vulnerability. Now, here's the thing is, is that you don't just come out and be like, Whoa! yeah you know i'm just gonna like put it all out okay no i encourage you when you are sharing your vulnerability in terms of your story follow what i refer to as the three r's number one be real folks okay be real think of someone that you highly respect that you admire and you listen to them speak and they tell you their story the challenges that they went through how they overcame those challenges and the lessons that they learned. Do you not have a newfound respect for someone like that? Yeah, that's what I mean by being real. See, one of the reasons why I personally don't care, I have a Facebook account, okay? And I'm not knocking Facebook, but one of the reasons why I personally don't care to be active on Facebook is because most people post all their good stuff, right? The selfies from this angle so that you makes you look skinny or the guys, that show their six pack or, you know, some of you are gonna be vacationing on spring break. I mean, good for you, do whatever you want. It's your life, I'm not knocking you, okay? But you know what? I'm gonna talk about the crap that I went through and how I overcame that. And let's see who connects and builds more authentic relationships. You with your six pack photos or me sharing with my heart. Number two, be relatable folks, be relatable. A Couple years ago, I did a talk for the San Jose Chamber of Commerce at the swanky place in downtown San Jose, morning breakfast, everyone's all suited up and all that type of stuff, right? That was cool. Two weeks later, this nonprofit also in San Jose serving the homeless invites me to go speak to homeless people on leadership. I'm like, what the heck am I gonna speak to homeless people on leadership? I've never spoken to homeless people on leadership. Like I probably could learn from them. I get in there and I'm sitting in this large conference room with about a dozen of the people that they serve there, the homeless people. Poor gentleman, one of them gets up and is walking out the door, collapses next to me. And it turns out, long story short, is, is that his doctor had adjusted his medication. So he was dry heaving and went ahead and gave my talk. Folks, I don't hang out with rich people or poor people. I don't hang out with brown people or white people. I hang out with everyone everyone and see right now in the workforce we have five generations my daughter's out in the workforce she's a gen z and then we have baby boomers and everyone else in between be relatable folks and then lastly be respectful be real relatable and respectful this will help you in telling your story expressing your vulnerability all right let's get into it okay get into the meat of things here in terms of creating your story, okay? I recommend that you stop Snapchatting or you know creating your TikTok videos while you're watching this webinar and pay attention and take some notes. So the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to make a list of all the skills that you have. And when I say all the skills that you have, even if you don't feel you're good at it, just write it down. All of them. You're probably going to come up with a list of about 30 or 40 of them. Just make a list. Just a dump of it. Okay. Next. What I want you to do is grab another piece of paper, another blank screen, and I want you to label it lessons learned and make three columns. Column on the left, I want you to label it life experience. In the middle, feelings. And on the right, skills. And I want you to go through your own personal exercise. I'm gonna use myself as an example. So number one, I told you about my family business. How did I feel? 
I told you I felt embarrassed. We have to own these feelings, folks, okay? And then on the far right, what is the skill that I learned? I told you work ethic. Re being in remedial English class at Cal, how did I feel? Imposter syndrome, inferior. But what is that skill that I learned how to be coachable? Because you know what? I was not gonna throw in the towel. Man, I went out to the tutors. I went to my floor mates. I went to the professor's office. I mean, everyone. Heidi was around, I'd probably go to the career center, even though, you know, like, hey, help me out with writing. And you just keep going through these experiences, the life experiences, and then those feelings that you had, and think of some skills that you learned. Next, we're going to start reframing this story here, okay? And again, you're going to write three columns. Left is going to be I'm using the example of the uh, six soft skills that I just shared with you. The middle is we're going to take our experience, life experiences again. On the far right, this time we're going to call it our purpose, why we do what we do. So for example, in my case, if I take the skill prioritization, right, I circle it, and then I take a life experience, like for example, my, family, uh, my family's business, what is the purpose? Why did I do that? Because for me, I love creating win-win situations in what I do. And this starts helping me reframe my story because now I take, I look at it from a position of strength instead of weakness and embarrassment of making chorizo on a Friday night. And I'm tying it to that skill, that soft skill, the skill that the company has. And what is the outcome? for both the company. Who doesn't want to hire? What company does not want to hire someone that is striving to create win-win situations? This, folks, you do this, exercise these exercises, start with your skills, okay, and life experience, and then this here, and you will then start putting together. It's like going grocery shopping. If you want to cook dinner tonight and the cupboards are empty, we got to go grocery shopping. So what you're doing here is you're buying the ingredients to make a meal. Now, there are five parts to your story. Number one is your why. Why do you do what you do? Now, there are two types of why, and I do a completely different um, talk on this. Um, there's the personal why. So like, for example, for me, my personal why, why I'm doing this webinar, I'm not getting paid or anything like that, is because I love helping other people dream bigger. I love inspiring them, and I love helping them. That's why I'm doing this. If it wasn't for those three reasons, I'd be like, peace out, okay? But the why that I'm referring to as you're putting your story to get hired it has to be what's in it for the employer, what's in it for them. In my case, my why is, you know, pretending you're my employer. My why for you is I empower you so opportunities come to you. See, it's what's in it for you. Number two, Start listing some of your personality traits. What are those? Number three, start writing down your career journey. Now, some of you might be thinking like, Oscar, but you know what? Like, I'm a freshman, you know? Like, I haven't really worked. Listen, your career journey can be whatever it is that you've done. I don't care if you delivered virtual newspapers, okay? If you're working at Starbucks. Whatever it is that you've been doing, internship, volunteer, that is part of your career journey. Also, if you have little to no work experience, what you can also do is sell your vision of what you want to accomplish. This, this is something that I've learned having worked in the startup, uh, startup world. Startups are oftentimes selling the vision. Think about this, okay? If I, about 12 years ago, these two crazy dudes went up, up and down Sand Hill Road talking to investors and they said, hey, listen guys, here's our idea. We're gonna get strangers to use their car and they're gonna pick up other strangers and then they're gonna drop them off at a strange location and we're gonna make a lot of money. Do you wanna invest in our company? What company am I talking about? Obviously Uber, they sold their vision. By you selling your vision, even if you have no experience, you're gonna kick butt over 52 year, old, 52 year olds like myself who given up. They're the ones who threw in the towel, folks. 
Next, list your awards and recognitions, okay, that you have. And then lastly, also talk about either your, you know, again, current position or company that you might be working at, you know, internships, et cetera. This is what makes up the five parts that make up uh, your story. I wanna show you an example, okay? This is actually an example. Obviously I crossed out the person's name and all that's not his name. That's not even his picture, okay? But this person on LinkedIn, Writes, educator, teacher, administrator, manager, consultant with experience in board governance, nonprofit and corporate, international business development, public and private higher education, like pause. Obviously this person is very talented, okay? He's not smart because he went to Stanford. No, I'm kidding, <laughs> okay? But he's obviously very accomplished. If I showed you this picture based on this profile, we would see, kind of guess how old he is. But what this person is, is done is he's horrible at marketing himself, at selling and, or excuse me, telling his story. Let me show you another example. So Angelica, right off the bat, okay? Angelica wants to be uh, an ethnic studies professor. And she writes, I'm a student at California State University of Monterey Bay who aspires to one day become a professor of ethnic studies. My goal as a future educator is to help create an engaging, creative, and strong educational foundation for future generations. My passion for education has been an ongoing co cause that has led me to volunteer for organizations such as Mesa de la Comunidad and the City of Mountain View's Youth Advisory Committee. By pursuing my passion for academia, I hope to expand my horizons and gain, in and gain more insight into a world of limitless possibility. Folks, I don't know about you, but I would... Um, I am, oops, sorry. I'm more likely to um, give uh, Angelica an informational interview or just talk to her versus the other person because of her story that she writes. Yet she has zero experience being a college professor. You see what I mean, folks, by having a strong knowing how to tell your, um, your story? Now here's my story. I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read it uh, all to you, but I share it here so that you can see that when we go grocery shopping and we the cupboards are full and the fridge are full, we have options. Okay, so with those options, if you were to go onto the Aspita Consulting website, you can see that was, I've taken my story and cut it up in little smaller pieces. Okay, because these two, the left and the right stories are part of my overall story here. Also, what I want to share with you with your story is there different formats. Some of you are great, obviously at written. That's not the only way to do it. Okay, but if you're, that's your strength then write it out. Okay, maybe on a blog or on LinkedIn or whatever social media. Some of you are great being in front of the camera. So make a video then to tell your story. Others, maybe it's audio. Maybe you do that now on a podcast or, or some other format, you know, where you create the audio and you tell your story. But just because you're not good with writing or you're not good with video or, or you're not good at audio, pick whatever medium, because this is really the, the three mediums that we primarily consume content as human beings. Okay, I'm gonna get into now um, building some connections here, networking, all right? And I'm gonna approach it obviously from an introvert perspective. So meeting new people for me as an introvert, that was scary, okay? I didn't like when I worked in the tech industry, I hated going to conferences, trade shows, and then afterwards they have a mixer. So I'm like, oh gosh, like, what did I say? Like, I would hang out over at the food area or the bar area, you know, cause I was like, oh, I'll make people come to me, you know, cause they're gonna come. But I reframed what networking and, and connecting with people is. And really what it is, it's just being a friend, being a friend. I'm like, I'm a friendly guy. And that's all I'm trying to do with, with you. And anytime that, that I do a webinar, I meet someone, I just virtually stick my hand out. Hi, I'm Oscar Garcia. But I also have the thick skin because many of you, I'm never going to see you again. You will never reach out to me. And I get it. Like I, that shouldn't hurt my feelings. Right? So 
It's just being a friend, folks. Now, why is making connections important? It's because of what I call the opportunity circle. See, folks, the smallest opportunity opportunities will come from our close friends and family. I know, it's kind of weird, huh? It's because they know the good, the bad, and the ugly of Oscar Garcia. My brother has seen, heard me go to him, see me like with my great, great idea 50 million times and never, I never do anything. So I was like, yeah, whatever, Oscar. Next, larger uh, um, circle of opportunity is our casual friends. But the largest circle of opportunity is gonna come from complete strangers. A year ago, Irma and I and Heidi and Kelly, we didn't know each other. In fact, I've only seen Heidi, I think, and Irma once in a year. And I feel, especially Heidi, because we've been on panels, I feel like we're brothers and sisters. Like I could tell her story and I'm sure she could tell my story too, my jokes. Like she knows what I'm gonna say next with my jokes. And it's, but think about that folks, a year ago, complete strangers. And we've only met once in person. Knowing how to network and connect with people is important. Now I'm gonna typically, you know, we hear the do's and don'ts. So I'm gonna start off with the don't, okay? What not to do first. First of all, when you connect with someone, if it's through LinkedIn, stop just hitting the plus symbol and connecting with someone. Stop pitching. Now, when I say sell, I'm using the word sell loosely. Some of you will just reach out to people like myself and asking for a job opportunity. You know what? I don't think he's on this web webinar, but a year ago when I did uh, the talk in person, love this dude, Naseki, okay? Go follow that dude, okay? I don't care if you're you know, on social media or whatever. That guy sat at the career center when I did a talk, he had his Beats headphones on. So I'm like, this guy even listening to me? And he was. About a month later, he sends me an invitation to connect on LinkedIn and he's, and he's like, hey, Oscar, you know what? I, you probably don't remember me. And so he tells me a little story and like, hey, you know what? I really love what you said, et cetera, and so forth. And the way he wrote his message was he wasn't asking anything. For him. He was more actually leading with the compliment. And we connected and the rest is history, folks. Do personalize your messages, personalize. Again, do compliment people, okay? I know as students, we are broke as heck, but you know what? We can all give a compliment. And then lastly is um, do the follow-up. And I wanna share with you some examples here, okay? But before I do, one of the places that I highly encourage you uh, is this is a screenshot of LinkedIn's uh, uh, Cal's LinkedIn page, or you can go all to other social media uh, platforms and follow the the uh, the school page on LinkedIn. What's cool about it, if you notice on the left side, just below Jobs, it says alumni. If you click on that tab, you're able to do searches based on geographic region, majors, companies of Cal alumni. I guarantee you almost 100% of the time when you send an invitation to connect to an alumni, they're probably gonna accept it because we know what you're going through, okay? We know, and you don't have to be perfect in your message or anything. Start there for some of you, especially uh, us introverts, okay? Now, here's an example of a cold connection because sometimes I get people, but how do I connect with people? What do I say to them? So David, is the vice president of global human resources at VMware. So he's like the top dog, he's way up there. One day I was on LinkedIn, like 11 o'clock at night, just looking through my feed. And I saw an article that someone in my network shared where the article, David talks about his immigrant story. I read it and I was inspired. I looked David up on LinkedIn and I sent him this, this message and I said, hi, David. I just read your story, inspiring. My parents were migrant workers and I can relate to your story. I welcome the opportunity to connect with you on LinkedIn. Folks, within five minutes of me sending him this message, look, you can see 11.13 p.m. at night. 11.18, he connected with me on LinkedIn. And now we're connected. How hard is it for you to send a message like this? We overthink networking and connecting with people. Here's another example, okay, about personalizing it. So Dania, just last week, uh, actually two weeks ago, she reached out to me on LinkedIn. 
Hello, Oscar. My name is Dania, and I'm a student intern with the Iconex. I would love to get 15 minutes of your time to get your feedback on setting up professional development sessions, sessions for Latino high school students. I would present about LinkedIn, email etiquette. Looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, I accept it. We had a Zoom call, and then she followed up. Remember I told you about follow-up? She sent me this email. Hello, Oscar. This is Dania. Uh, for me, and we met earlier today. Thank you so much for speaking with me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. She has even her email signature. Okay, can I tell you something, folks? She's 17 years old. She's in high school. She's a senior in high school. And, and listen, I don't mean this out of disrespect, but some of you professionals out there, she's kicking your rear end and knowing how to do email etiquette because most of you have like your papi chulo at Gmail an email address, which is inappropriate, okay? Like get a professional email address for what you're doing. And then how about adding a email signature like this high school student did? Because isn't that what work professionals have? Email signatures, like professionalized folks. See, all these things that I'm telling you, when I realized this, that I did not need to major in electrical engineer, computer science at Cal, and like take stat 547, that I just needed to, Take the skills that I learned my entire life through the, my life's challenges that I could kick butt. I'm like, hallelujah, I'm gonna rock it. Now, once we make those connections, we have to learn how to nourish those relationships, okay? How do you do that? Here are some ways. One is I encourage you to share content information and don't give me the stuff that I don't know what to share okay because if I go onto your Instagram Facebook Snapchat account I can totally see what you're sharing which is inappropriate for to get hired I'm not saying not to have fun okay I have fun all right follow the rule of thirds a third of what you share we're talking your career wise professional share about your personal brand for me obviously it's LinkedIn training career development community relations work social selling. I believe in taking care of the environment. I believe in Earth Day, but that's not my brand. So therefore I will never comment or share on those type of posts because it's not in alignment with my brand. Number two, share stuff about your industry, your major. You're majoring in economics. Some of you I saw rhetoric and English. Well, guess what? English and rhetoric, that means that your punctuation and your ability to speak is probably really good. So I want to see some blocks. And then lastly, share other people's content. Keep it simple. Let me show you some examples of some posts that I've shared. This is actually from last year. Uh, number one, the post that I share with the most likes is actually this post here where I talk about the changing within the Latino community, the, the names, you know, Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano, today is Latinx, right? Also, the post that had the most comments, okay, on LinkedIn. This picture that my brother sent me where the, uh, the, the, the uh, translation, the English translation is completely wrong. Party translated into English in this context is not fiesta. It is different, okay? Now I know us Mexicans love to party, okay? But I don't think that this sign meant that kind of translation. It's hilarious. Also, the post that had the most views was a post that I shared my story about getting laid off. You see folks how the first two posts, the likes and the comments actually have to do more with like part of my first gen story in my ethnicity. And then the one that had the most views had to do me sharing my story about career story about getting laid off. What did I tell you about connecting with people's heart first? Now here's some strategies to engage with posts. One, follow hashtags that are relevant to your industry or your major. Follow influencers. And when I say influencers, I know most people think, oh, you know, like follow Bill Gates and all that. Like, yeah, fine, follow. But I'm talking about follow what, what I refer micro influencers. Do you realize that people like Heidi, Ema, Kelly, and, and so forth, they are very influ influential on campus and in their, their, their sphere of what they do? Follow them, connect with them. Also target your comments. And I'm gonna share with you some tips on what I mean by that. 
Also, if you're going to be on LinkedIn, LinkedIn also has LinkedIn stories. Okay, I'm talking to most of you that already know what stories are, okay? Because you're already posting your stories on Instagram reels, okay? And stuff like that. And then lastly, follow what I call the 25. It's 20-5 rule. So let me tell you what I mean. The 20-5 rule is look at posts that have roughly about 20 engagements, you know, like the little likes, hearts or whatever, and then roughly about five or more comments and go in there, assuming obviously they're in alignment with your brand. Okay. Go in there and comment. What do I say, Oscar? Hey, Eduardo, you know what? <laughs> that was a really funny video that you shared and a great lesson. Thanks for sharing. That's it. Why do I tell you this? Because every person on that 25 or more that are like the comp, you know, thumbs up, whatever heart, as well as a comment gets alerted that you commented on that post. And they, then if it's on LinkedIn, they go onto your profile, potentially they can go onto your profile and see it. It has happened to me where oftentimes people go to my profile, they read about me, et cetera, and so forth. And they're like, Hey, Oscar, my gosh, I love what you do. Can we connect? Awesome. Hey, as an introvert, I want people to come to me. I don't like begging other people to connect with them. All right, I'm gonna open up to some questions. Oh, right, right on time, open up some questions. All right, folks, before I open it up to some questions, I want you to drop it in the comments, rank this talk one to 10. In fact, you can even go negative 10, okay? If it really was horrible and you can go above 10 if it was amazing, okay? I mean, all feedback is welcome. So drop it right now. And um, when it, here's my contact information. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram. I have a podcast called Career Talk with OG. It's on all the pa platforms out there. There's my phone number. You can even text me on that number. There's my email address. There's my website. I just need to give you my social security number, okay? I'm very accessible. So um, I don't know if I should, Kelly or Edema or Heidi, whoever it is that I want to turn it over to for some questions. Yeah, I, I think um, if you all have questions, you are you can unmute yourself and ask the questions or drop them in the chat. Um, you're getting a lot of good 10s and 20s and nailed it <clears throat> comments. So uh, clapping hands. So I'm sure students have questions. I just, uh, th there aren't any in the chat, but you're welcome to unmute yourself. We have one that says, I love the talk, but I'd love to hear about how mental health plays a part of this professional development journey. Um, so you're trying to understand the, the, the question. Is, is this person, um, are they saying that they themselves have experience or some, some mental health uh, situations and so therefore they wanna learn how to share, share that story? Is that, is that kind of the? It doesn't say. Um, yes, she says yes. Yeah, so first of all, folks, when I tell you to share your story, you have to be ready to share your story. Okay, I mean, that's the caveat. We have to be ready. When I say being ready is obviously, you know, there's a healing process, et cetera, that takes place, okay? We have to be ready to, to share that. So I think that's really, really important. And only you know when you're ready to share your story and what parts of the story you're ready. Don't let anyone um, force you or try to push you, you know, come on, you know, so-and-so did it. So you, we all have our own timeline. Secondly is, is that what I wanna share with you too is sometimes we're concerned about, well, what if I share something about my story and the, my, the prospective employer disqualifies me? That can happen folks. And, and I don't agree with it. But here's the thing. I'm not a fit for every job opportunity that's out there. I'm not. As nice of a person I am, I'm not a fit. And I'm okay with that. It's like when I applied to college, okay? I'm not a fit for every college out there. We get rejected. And we have to accept that, you know what? Maybe that just wasn't the right fit, that company. It's like, see folks, let me tell you this. Let me put it this way. I've had, my daughter is 24 years old. She's single, but one day, you know, she's probably going to get married and, you know, get engaged. 
and she's engaged. And she comes to me, hey, dad, you know what? You know, the, our wedding is in a month, but Paul here says that, you know, he doesn't like this, this is about me. And I don't know, dad, what do you think? Should, should I go forward with the, with, the, with, with, the, with the wedding? You know what I would tell my daughter? Dump the guy. Good thing that he's telling you this now versus getting married. It's not an easy decision. It wouldn't be painful. But we spend the majority of our waking hours at a job. We spend more of our waking hours at a job than we do with our loved ones. Do what is right for you. Find a company that values you as a person, what you bring to the party. And if there isn't that culture match, go find someone else. Go find another opportunity. We have another question. What are some ways to build your story on LinkedIn? Do you recommend videos, articles, posts, et cetera? And if so, what's the best way that gets the most likes and views? Yeah, so actually all those that we just mentioned, videos, articles, and, and so forth, um, those are actually, there is, isn't one that's better than the other. And the reason why I tell you this is because we, all of us consume content differently. Like I, I fall asleep reading a regular book, but I know the value of reading. And so now today I do audio books, okay? And so, so again, share your story in different formats. That's why I shared it, uh, how I shared it earlier. If you were to go connect with me on LinkedIn, you would see that my story, I've shared it written I've shared it video. I've shared it in a little micro post because you just never know how the Heidi's, the Edemans, the Kelly's in the world are going to consume my story. Also, sometimes people just need just a little taste. It's like going to Baskin Robbins. They give it a little taste, right? And you're like, oh, this is great. I'll order it. And so maybe they just need a little taste of your story for them to reach out to you and be like, Heidi, that was so great. I love, I, you know what? You have, you're so talented. And all of a sudden, it opens the door to a conversation so that now they can hear more uh, of your story. So that's what I recommend. Next one. What are some strategies for dealing with imposter syndrome? And how has new learning impacted your career tra trajectory? Oh, yeah. So let me ask you the last part of the question. So one of the things that I realized is that the importance of always learning. See, most of us graduate from college and we never open a textbook anymore. We don't read or even audiobooks. And for me, that's one of the things that I learned because I was that shy person that you know, didn't know what to say to strangers. My friend, I told you at the beginning, my friend, Will Rivera, that dude became, went off to go to law school, to Bolt Law School, and for many years now works down in Los Angeles for district attorney. That guy could speak off the cuff. And I used to look at Will and I would be in awe and amazement. I'm like, oh my God, it's like, oh, I wish I could be like Will. And I just kept, I embarked in a personal growth and development, kept reading, reading, et cetera, and so forth, okay? So always be learning. Now, in terms of imposter syndrome, I actually, that's another talk that I do, okay? Um, but I'll give you just some, some general tips. First of all, with imposter syndrome, part of it is we need to let go of some of the cultural baggage, some of the misperceptions that we have, okay? Um, secondly is, is that we need to believe in ourselves. If there's one thing that I, if I could go back and change, would be to go way back in time and believe in myself a lot sooner because I would be way further ahead. The other thing too with imposter syndrome is we need to stop caring what other people say, the opinions of others. Folks, five years ago, when I lost both my parents, my dad first, four months later, I have half siblings on my dad's side. And I'm not blaming, I'm just telling a story here. Not one of them offered to give my younger brother and I a penny for our dad's funeral service. I'm not knocking them, but I'm just telling you that it, 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 it was eye-opening for me because why should I be like, why should I be worried about your pain if you don't pay my bills? If my siblings didn't even give me a penny for the funeral service, like why? No. 
those are some things that I'm hearing. And like I said, there's way more. You're welcome to connect with me. We can get into some more specifics, but there's a complete talk that I do on imposter syndrome alone. It is important and a very deep topic. The next question is, do you have any tips for students that are going to virtual career fairs? How can we create better connections through video chat? Yeah, well, folks, first of all, what I encourage you to do, let's take it even a step further. When, when try to see, sometimes they list the, well, obviously they list ahead of time, the companies that are gonna be there. See if you can identify who some of the people are gonna be participating. Usually, depending on the size of the company, you, they, you, they might have like a university recruiting department. Try to look those people up on LinkedIn, for example. That's usually the, the ideal platform to do. Connect with them ahead of time. Hey, Kelly, hey, I noticed uh, you know, that your company is gonna be at the upcoming Cal Career Fair. Um, wondering if you're gonna be there. Um, I'll be participating. Can we connect on LinkedIn? Some of those people will connect, some of them won't. Once you connect with them on LinkedIn, now you can start getting a better understanding for what is important to them. What type of post, the things that I shared earlier, and you start engaging on their posts so that now when you meet them virtually, it's more of a warm introduction. And it's gonna be like, Kelly says, oh, hey, Oscar, yeah, I remember I seen your post. But see, it requires this building and nourishing relationships that I mentioned. See, it always blows my mind, folks. Because, and, and I don't tell you because I need my ego boosted. Absolutely not. It's, it's a reflection on all of you here. But it blows my mind how I think all of you knew that I was the speaker. Yet, I don't think I received one invitation out of 100 and who knows, 60 plus people that registered. I don't think I received one invitation to connect on LinkedIn from many of you. I told you, you don't need an electrical engineer or computer science degree to figure that out what I just told you. Do those things folks. Okay, do you have any tips or practice tips that you recommend to do before an interview? Uh, yeah, so one thing is practice, practice, practice. Actually, um, folks, you can Google now, okay? But even LinkedIn has a cool feature. Uh, I think it's even on the free version, okay? I have the free version of LinkedIn. But um, you can um, look at some of the questions common questions that employers ask for and just practice some of those questions. Get on Zoom. You can get a free Zoom account and I think it gives you like 40 minutes for free. Practice with some of your friends and like, hey, listen, dude, let's just practice me being doing uh, you know, a virtual interview here right now, okay? If, see, one of the things, if, I, I, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm, I'm actually standing. Next time watch, you're on a webinar with another presenter, 99% of the time those presenters are sitting down. I'm standing up. Why? Because for me, this gives me more energy and I speak with my hands. Okay. I'm more engaging. And, and how, why, how does that come? I didn't pop out of my mother's womb being like, Ugh! okay, no, it took practice. Practice last year alone, I did 145 online events. You think by then I would be good at virtual. That's why I told you I can speak to a wall and give the exact same presentation with the same animation energy. So practice, practice, practice. Do you have any tips for students to stay motivated during uncertain times? Yeah. Um, you know what? Here's the other thing. And you can go onto the Espita YouTube channel because I did a short little clip on motivation. Okay. Most of us folk try to focus on motivation. Folks, motivation is a drug. It just gives you a high and then it drops you down. Don't focus on motivation, folks. Focus on your purpose. Focus on your purpose on why you do what you do. I told you earlier that the reason why I'm doing this for free, okay? And there's been times, I actually, this morning, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, folks, to do another workshop for a group of students in Germany. I'm tired. You drain me doing this. But I'm not motivated to do this talk. I'm doing it because I love helping other people dream bigger, inspire them and serving them. So quit focusing on motivation. That's a drug. Focus on your purpose. Identify what that is. Uh, do you have any tips for students who are interviewing but keep getting rejected? My mental health is definitely going down. You know, it is, yeah, it is disheartening, um, obviously, doing that. That, see, this, I'm going to give you some general 
a general answer because this question begs more of a one-on-one -on -one interaction to identify more specifically. Um, that's like you going to the doctor and be like, hey, doctor, I have a shoulder pain. You know, can you tell me that's like, uh, I don't know, maybe you have a tumor. I don't know, okay? But here's the thing is, is that pause, if you, it, the best way to get hired, and I tell you this from personal experience, is to network. Get people to open up and hear your story. Next, okay, if you are, you're getting rejected, reach back out to that person and ask them if they're willing to give you some honest, constructive feedback. I did that and it helped me, it, it, it helped me out, right? So that I can make some tweaks, maybe I have some blind spots and so forth, okay? That's why I asked you to rank the webinar, like give me some honest feedback, okay? All right, and then lastly, number three is, is that, um, look, look at identifying and building more people within an organization. Don't, don't just rely on the recruiter. Don't just rely on the hire manager, but look to form a, 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 a network of supporters. Like I told you earlier, like now at the career center, Heidi, Irma and Kelly, right? We know each other. Now that's three people. In the beginning it was just Irma and then it went into Heidi, right? Not Mark and so forth, okay? There's other people. So I, so I build the support because these other people, if something goes wrong, maybe these other people can vouch for me and convince this other person. So those are some things that I recommend. If this is our last question or close to our last question, on the topic of nourishing relationships, one thing I struggle with is keeping in touch with important contacts. I often find myself only reaching out when I need something. Do you have any tips on how to stay connected with folks from the stranger ring of the opportunity circle. Yeah. So one thing you, you mentioned in this question is that you only reach out to people when you need something. So you need to stop that. You need to stop that, okay? Um, here's some things that I do. So first of all is by me being active on social media in my activity, I give a lot of tips. If you follow me, you see that I give a lot of tips. Okay, that stays top of mind. It is value added. People appreciate that. Number two is I also every Friday take it upon myself that I do a shout out that I call thank God for my network. I randomly highlight someone in my network. I say something positive. I tag them. If they say something bad, great. If they don't, great too. But my network sees that. Oftentimes they do comment. It's like, hey, thanks, Oscar. Appreciate it. Number three, you know how we get those alerts? like on Facebook about someone's birthday, you know what most people do is they type in their page, happy birthday. Some people, they don't even say happy birthday. They just now HBD, HBD. Like seriously, dude, like our relationship now is just through three letters. Don't do that. What I do is I actually either text them or call them assuming I have their number. Hey, Heidi, how's it going, man? What have you been up to? I, you know, we haven't talked in a long time. I don't mention it's her birthday or anything. If Heidi says, hey, you know what? Oh my gosh, Oscar, today's my birthday. What? Happy birthday, Heidi. Because see, 98% of the people just go on their Facebook page and, and post and only 2% call Heidi. I stand out more. That's it. Guys, that's why I'm telling you, as a 52-year-old, most of your parents probably thrown in the towel. And I don't mean that out of disrespect, okay? But most of your parents are thrown in the towel right now at 52 years old. And that's why at 52 years old, I'm kicking butt. I'm going to live to 150 years old. Okay. <clears throat> Would you recommend to reach out to the recruiter after an interview, especially after you didn't from form as well as you could have. Yes. Reach out to them before and after. If it's after and you feel like you didn't do well, hey, Kelly, hey, I just want to reach out to you. You know what? I just want to tell you that yeah, I don't think I did really well in that interview. This is what's going on. You know what? Gosh, I bombed my midterm and uh, that was on my mind. And uh, I just want to see if we can reconnect again and kind of get a second chance. May work. It may not, but I can guarantee you they're going to appreciate the honesty. Folks, when you bomb a midterm, at least this is what I learned, right? What did I tell you about subject A? Okay. A bomb a midterm, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to go into office hours and talk to the professor. You know, just like, oh gosh, I bombed the midterm. Let me see. No. 
same concept with recruiters seeking jobs. So are there any questions that you might ask at the end of an interview that may help job seekers get a better understanding of the company culture? Yeah, so first off, that question too, you can go nowadays on to uh, Indeed, Glassdoor, look at reviews. You can also watch videos, right, about uh, the company, you know, maybe products or services. You can also watch, like if the company is public, you can watch the earnings video right now and you can get a sense of how they, so go on to social media. Folks, I go on to social media, right? And I can get a feel for how some of the CEOs post and how they post. That gives me a feeling for whether like, oh, I don't know if I want to work at that company, if I ever would want to work at that company. But when you're in that interview, some of the things that, uh, you know, one question that you can, that you can ask uh, in that interview is ask them about in terms of um, learning and development opportunities. If that's important to you, you know, they can tell you, oh, you know, we have this or, you know, or we're thinking of doing this because that gives you some insight in terms of, right, how much value they put into uh, their employees' professional uh, development. Um, but stuff like that, those are just some of the, the things that you can do to really give you an insight on the company culture. We have one last question, and this is the last question. Um, you mentioned being vulnerable, but when do you know when you're being too personal? You know, that's really, it's really up to you. It really is. I, I, folks, when I shared my very first article on LinkedIn titled, I am a minority, and I talked about my mother being undocumented and, you know, uh, affirmative action at Berkeley and so forth. I got a, an overwhelming positive response, but there were also some people that said some negative things. I'm just speaking from my heart, folks. It's like some of you could care less about my story and that's fine. I'm okay with that. It's really like, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that don't let someone else judge that you're being, too, that you know, it's too personal or not enough. Are you speaking from a genuine position of caring, compassion, and, and sharing your story to help and inspire and uplift others? Or are you complaining and whining? That's how you can tell, folks. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you especially to Oscar Garcia for presenting. Um, it was wonderful. I think all the students were really excited and have really positive comments about this. Um, I want to remind our students that next month, um, March 2nd, we will be having our second um, workshop under the First Gen series, and that is navigating the academic setting as a first gen student. So we're going to have four faculty members come and talk to students about how to get the most out of being a Cal, uh, how to approach them for letters of recommendation, um, how to come to office hours prepared, et cetera. So we encourage you all to attend. And then you can sign your handshake.